Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are. So welcome back. This is Nadia from Janat Machines. And then I just want to greet you first before we start the event. So hello, hello, everyone. It's good to see you. I hope everybody's safe and happy and healthy as well. So yes, today, uh, Janat Machines is having a special event with uh, Fun High Univer uh, with International School of Finance at Fudan University. So Fun High International School of Finance at Fudan University will be sharing more information about the industry insights. So there will be like a talk about uh, the topic of cross-border PE and VC investment processes and decision-making. And also after that, there will be like an info session from the Finance MBA program at Fun High International School of Finance of Wudan University. So for today, we are having two special guest speakers who will share about these uh, two topics, which are the industry insights and also the info session for the finance MBA program. So for the industry insights topic where it will be discussing about the cross-border PE or VC investment processes and decision-making, we have Mr. Wilson Tsai, the vice president of Lean Partners Group. And also for the finance MBA uh, program info session, we have teacher Real Chen from uh, the admissions team of the program. So yeah, uh, before we get started, make sure that you have all of your uh, audio and everything connected well so you can go through the whole session beautifully without no technical issues. And yes, if you can hear me okay, if you can see the screen or anything, you can also say something on the chat box. And don't worry if you have any questions about the uh, finance MBA programs or about the industry, uh, feel free to ask. You can uh, drop your questions on the Q&A section, and then your questions will all be discussed at the end of this uh, session today. So yeah, we hope this information and we hope the event is uh, good for you, and we hope that you gain more knowledge from this event, and also you get more understanding about the Finance MBA program at Fudan University. So yeah, thank you everyone, and enjoy the session. Hello everyone, just want to double check if that video can come clearly. Hello, uh, if you cannot help me, you can just like leave your message in the text box to let me know you cannot help us clearly. And uh, thank you for making all the effort coming to the webinar today. And uh, today's webinar will be four parts. First, we will have a short broker introduction, and then we will welcome Wilson to have the industry insight about the cross-border VCPE. After that, we will do the information for like 10 to 15 minutes. If you have any questions about the uh, industry insights or about the info session, feel free to leave a message in the text box. And also, at the last bit, we will share some information about the admission policies. Uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to leave a message. And uh, I am Rio Chen. Uh, some of you have contacted me before, and I am assistant manager of the international admissions from Fan Hai International School of Finance at the University. And thank you again for coming to the webinar today. First of all, I want to do some introduction about Fudan University. And uh, as one of the very top university in China, and uh, Fudan University always performed excellent in all the rankings. In the 2022 QS Global Rankings, Wudan ranked 31st and also we have 11th University in the Asia University Rankings 2021. And uh, everyone knows Wudan University is a very top university, but few of them will notice that we are so excellent in the finance area. Well, Wudan University was established in 1905 and to now we have over 100, uh, 100 years and 100 years history. But in 1917, Fudan University is the first university established finance department. And to the 1981, again, Fudan University is the first university to open the master's degree and give to a DBA, a DBA degree in China. In 1987, again, Fudan University became the only uh, university in the East China who has a finance as a major as the national key discipline. And in 2017, Fudan University uh, published the uh, International School of Finance and we start to put FMBA program. If you are interested in Fudan University or if you're interested in FMBA program, it's perfect time for you 
to know more details. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email and I will support you at any stage of the application. Okay, cool. Then I think I will leave the uh, webinar room to Wilson. And uh, if, if you have any questions, please uh, uh, feel free to text me. Hi, everybody. Um, it's nice to meet everybody online in this format. Um, first, I want to go ahead and thank Fudan University's uh, Fenhai International School of Finance for the invitation. Um, my name is Wilson Tsai. I'm a vice president uh, for a PEVC fund called Women Partners Group. We are based here in Shanghai. Uh, we have offices in Tokyo as well as Hong Kong. And for over the past six years, we've been investing globally throughout the world, uh, inside of China, outside of China. And we've primarily been focused on investing in a lot of technology-driven companies, uh, specifically in the fintech space. A little bit about me, as I don't want to spend too much time during this seminar, uh, simply just going over um, some broad details. Um, I myself had actually come from the United States. I am a uh, native of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, after uh, my own education, uh, I actually had a chance to work in China very briefly for SBI uh, China, which used to be known as SoftBank uh, Investments. Uh, after that, I also had a career in investment banking within uh, in San Francisco, uh, covering uh, a multitude of high tech sectors as well. And after my uh, investment banking experience, I decided to uh, come back to China and work alongside Lumi Partners. Um, I think for the purposes of this seminar today, we're about to take a deep dive into uh, cross-border PEVC and the investment uh, process that usually you know, people within the profession would be very familiar with. Um, I know that many of you who are listening right now are also quite familiar with uh, PEVC to a certain extent, whether it, it is uh, maybe an industry you're already working in, or um, if you are been observing through the sidelines, uh, a lot of the famous PEVC funds around the world make large investments. Um, you know, there is usually a very big image uh, when it comes to PEVC that it is something that's highly complex. It is something that's fairly advanced. Um, and we could go straight into the topics about the metrics and um, different performance uh, indicators that a lot of PEVC uh, investors might look at. But for today's purposes, and especially because I know that those listening uh, come from a wider variety of backgrounds uh, and experiences, I want to simplify things, but also still kind of uh, bring light to the fact uh, of how simple and actually uh, how historical uh, PEVC really is. So with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and perhaps get started with my first question. And again, uh, I see a chat screen here uh, in our conference room. And so if you, you have any questions, and in this case, any answers, uh, please feel free to provide them in the chat room as well. But it's very simple. And uh, being that uh, I am technically a PEVC investor, and I'm also someone who uh, is a big fan of studying history. My first question is, which country, which country in the world invented the modern concept of stocks? So uh, at this point, I think what we'll do is we're gonna go ahead and maybe give uh, about 30 seconds to a minute uh, for people to maybe uh, supply a response um, through the chat box. And um, yeah, we'll go ahead and just wait very shortly. A little bit awkward silent time, but um, obviously, if you guys are in front of computers, you guys have your phones on you, feel free to go ahead and Google search if need be. Um, this isn't too difficult of a question, but it's also a good way to maybe think back um, during this quick 20 seconds left of, hey, what are some countries that developed earlier on, uh, have a longer financial history, and might have a need for capital? Awesome. So we do have one response already from uh, Matt and Lurie, who says that it's the Netherlands, starting with the Dutch East India Company. Excellent response. That is correct. 
stocks, the modern concept of stocks, at least, were invented in the Netherlands. And um, I think a lot of people um, also don't know this, but the very first stock exchange uh, very much uh, was born in the Netherlands as well. Um, and the response that we got, which is uh, the Dutch East India Company, that is indeed uh, the organization, uh, the corporation, the multinational corporation based in the Netherlands that started the concept of stocks. But let's let's put all these things aside. And what I really want to get down to is why, why, why do these, uh, why did the Netherlands, why was the stock born here? Um, so. I'm not sure how many people who are listening right now have actually been to Northern Europe. Uh, and if you guys have, maybe you guys have some experience with this, but uh, what's very interesting, especially because we're based in China and uh, we live in a land that's full of spices and flavors. Uh, you've been to Sichuan, you've obviously had great food uh, here in the uh, Tangsanjiao, the, the, the river Delta, we obviously have very rich and flavorful foods. But if you were to go to the Netherlands, this is what their food looks like. It's very bland fish, not a lot of seasoning, uh, maybe just a little bit of salt. But again, if you're looking for more exotic spices, if you're looking for more flavors, um, the Netherlands is probably not going to be very famous for that. But again, it is through that very same reason, because in Northern Europe, we don't get access to rich spices and goods um, to you know, obviously help make your food taste better. Um, you have a need for these spices. So that is the key question. If the Netherlands, if you're living in the Netherlands in the 1600s, the 1500s, and you want to get some spices, where would you want to go? So um, on this map, I've kind of helped eliminate the potential uh, responses here, but uh, does anyone know what was a key hub of spices? And if you were to focus on this map, you know, what country within this map would have those spices. We'll also give this a quick, you know, 20 to 30 seconds to see uh, what kind of responses we get. Ah, same uh, response from uh, our participant who answered before. That is correct. It is indeed India uh, with its rich curries, peppers, um, and a whole uh, variety of different spices that are available. But here's what uh, is interesting. Before, when the Dutch wanted to buy spices from India, the supply chain to actually receive those spices or purchase those spices was quite complicated. First, Indian merchants or spice merchants would actually first sell to Persia. So I've gone ahead and added a little red line of this trade that would go into Iran. Um, and other neighboring countries. And then they themselves acting as middlemen would purchase some of the top spices and then pass along the remainder to Turkey. Then Turkey would go ahead and do the same thing, scrape off the top and then uh, pass along the remaining spices within this spice trade to the Netherlands. Now it goes without saying that within this trade, there's already a lot of issues that could occur. Uh, first and foremost, these are vastly different cultures, vastly different governments, and different civilizations with different religions. Wars can break out. There could be a whole slew of different complications along the journey. So again, in order for Northern Europeans to procure spices, there is deemed a lot of risk. There could be a high markup to prices because there are so many middlemen from Iran to Turkey to Northern Europe. By the time they actually, the spices actually arrive in Northern Europe, the quality of the product can actually be extremely diminished. And like I said before, wars, bandits, pirates, uh, enemy armies could all be along the supply chain line, uh, disrupting the supply chain flow, making it extremely difficult for uh, people uh, in the Netherlands to receive these spices. So in order to actually solve this problem, the Dutch were quite innovative. Instead of taking a straight line through these landlocked regions, they decided to actually start 
uh, constructing brand new boats and taking voyages uh, on these boats around Africa, around the Cape or the, the Cape of South Africa, uh, and all the way up the Indian Ocean and to India to actually finally procure their spices. But at this point, you could say, okay, the Dutch have clearly cut out the middlemen and have found a way to go direct to the stores to purchase and procure their spices. But even a long journey like this, there could be a great amount of risk as well. There's obviously dangers on the seas, whether it's pirates from Somalia or if it's uh, high winds and storms that any boat might come across. Obviously, if the crew that is operating the boat, if they have conflicts within them, there might be a mutiny and maybe they just go ahead and take the ship and go to Australia and live their lives on the beaches of Melbourne. And obviously there's macroeconomic risk. And what I mean by this is uh, a journey from the Netherlands to, to India uh, at that time could take anywhere from months uh, and barring maybe certain, certain issues that might come up, uh, perhaps they could even take uh, a year um, or more. So during this long time period, it's very difficult for these ships who are on in the middle of their voyages to clearly know uh, what kind of the condi market conditions there are in India. What if today we're starting off in the Netherlands, we only have a hundred blocks of gold that we pack onto the ship to trade for spices in India. But then when we get to India, maybe we originally thought the price uh, of a single block of curry was one block of gold. But then for whatever macroeconomic reasons, that occurred within India, the price might have gone up. So the amount that you procure uh, uh, in terms of curry blocks or spices could be a lot less than you originally projected. So these are also all very big risks that go along um, with this Atlantic, with this journey around the sea. So if I was an investor and I was currently in the Netherlands uh, right at this moment, I'd be thinking, if I used all my money on one ship, on one ship that would go all the way from Northern Europe to India, uh, I'd be under a lot of stress because the moment one of these risks occurs and it, my ships are exposed to this risk and I lose my ship, uh, all of my capital, all of my money would also sink to the bottom of the ocean floor. And so that is really the concept uh, or the problem that stocks that stocks um, were invented to actually help solve. Instead of one person owning one ship and the ownership of that certain ship, they decided to fractionalize it through legal contracts, um, through partnership, uh, into many different pieces of stock. And not only did one ship do this, all the ships in Netherlands uh, through the syndication provided, syndication services provided by the Dutch East India Company, they decided to do the same thing. Let's split up all the ownership rights of a variety of our ships and then go out to Northern Europe and see who would like to purchase uh, these shares, uh, whether it be in an offering to fundraise for the voyage or if they want to trade it. So, my question to you is, and right here, I've actually uh, added a, a very cute photo of uh, one of the founders of the Dutch East India Company. Um, if you were him and you were someone who was living in uh, the 1500s, 1600s in Netherlands, which shares would you, would you buy? Would you buy from the black ship, the orange ship, the green ship? And then how many shares of each ship would you buy? You know, I, I want to take a pause right here and also just uh, note that, you know, uh, I know that a lot of uh, the participants and people who are listening into this seminar, you guys might also work in finance and, uh, I, I, you know, someone who's, as someone who's, you know, worked personally in investment banking, uh, been on Wall Street, uh, has, you know, worked on, you know, complicated, uh, you know, complex deal structures, it often seems as though what happens in the finance world is extremely um, uh, complex and difficult to understand. But I, I do wanna say that at the core of what investment is, it is 
different pieces of risk that you can go and analyze and place your bets on. Uh, but I want to come back here and uh, come back to this question, which shares should I buy and how many shares uh, of those ships would I buy? So obviously this then points to, okay, if I'm going to make a decision like this, if I'm going to start choosing the ships, I obviously need to know, you know, which ship has the highest chance of success, which ship would actually take me all the way from Northern Europe uh, to India successfully, procure the spices and then bring it back to Northern Europe. So, you know, what are some questions that everyone would ask here? Um, obviously I've pre-prepped a few, um, but I, I would also uh, would love to see a few responses from the group to see if uh, anyone has any good ideas. If you want to, if you're an investor in Northern Europe and you wanted to own uh, a portion or a share of a certain ship that was going to India, how would you actually go and determine uh, or what questions would you ask to find out which ship had the highest chance of success? Let's go ahead and give this maybe 30 seconds. And I see there is a um, question from uh, from a student here. Uh, they're asking, how did they set the price valuation of the ship at the time and the share prices? That's a very good question. And I can already uh, clue you in. It's not so different from how we value companies today, whether we're using a DCF or we're using a comparables uh, analysis model. I'm gonna probably save this question until uh, the end of this slide, and then I'll explain it very, very quickly. All right. Looks like we don't have that many responses this time, but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys a few questions that I thought of. So obviously, if I wanna know who has the highest chance of getting to India, buying the spices, bringing it back, the very first question I might ask is, hey, how much experience does the ship's crew and the leadership team have? Second question I might ask is, okay, what spice are they paying to purchase? Are they trying to buy some oregano, some cilantro, some peppers, or maybe some curry? Um, and then what are the qualities of that spice? Does that spice have a specific differentiator or maybe a better price, um, a longer uh, expiration date or expiration duration? Uh, what's the ship's intended plan or strategy to get to India and back? Because although through this photo or through this image right here, I'm telling everyone that, hey, we're just going to go simply this direction and then come around the Cape of Africa and go to India. Uh, the actual strategy, it, there could be a lot of nuances. For example, hey, are they going to uh, you know, depart from the Netherlands in the winter or in the spring, in the summer or in the autumn? Um, you know. Are they going along with certain currents or certain patterns or trade routes? Uh, who will be protecting them? Is the Dutch army deploying ships around the Horn of Africa just to make sure that uh, there's no bandits or pirates on the oceans? You know, there are specific pathways that different ships can choose to take. And I obviously would want to know what my uh, ship's captain has planned. And lastly, what will be the weather conditions for the duration of each ship's voyage? So, um, you know, the reason why we went into this big introduction or this story about why stocks, how stocks were created and where they come from, um, a lot of it is just trying to show you guys that there is practically no difference between the questions that someone in the 1600s would ask about a certain ship's chance of success of getting to India and back and what PEVC investors ask of new startups today. For how much experience does the ship's crew and leadership team have? This question is always asked in every single investment community meeting, which is how much experience does the company's management team have? Is this founder someone that, who has actually built a product or a platform before? Have they uh, successfully grown their product or platform um, or solution and maybe had a successful IPO or an M&A or an exit? And hey, do they have a correct educational background? Um, second one. Similar to what kind of spice they're planning to purchase, you know, what is the company's core product and how does it differ compared to others? Um, that's a very key question. A product analysis is something that we'd always do in every single analysis of a new company that we're trying to invest in. 
And then obviously, hey, what's the company's strategic business plan and development roadmap? And what are the current market conditions and trends that could benefit or damage this company's business prospects? Just a quick anecdote, uh, a lot of how we, or I guess my team uh, at Loan Partners determines investment uh, today is very much tied to macroeconomic trends. What are we seeing in the US and how might that affect China? And then what are we seeing in China that could affect Southeast Asia? And then if these trends were to be true and they were to uh, play out the way that we think they're going to play out, what kind of companies and products and solutions would do well in that market? What will that market in the future with these trends and conditions demand? So again, I want to emphasize that in reality, PVC is not a new investment methodology or a hot new trend or uh, anything to do with um, you know, how Silicon Valley or uh, these innovators um, you know, thought of a way to somehow capitalize on new technology. Uh, in reality, you know, PVC, how we measure risk, how we make investment decisions, it's not so far off from how it was already done centuries ago. Um, and uh, just to go back to the question that was asked, how do they set the price valuation of each ship? Um, and you know what are the share prices for for each of these small blocks of shares? Obviously, uh, every single ship, like I said, they might have a certain target. Uh, when they're on their way to India, they might have uh, an amount of gold or silver or some type of valuable money that they want to go and exchange for spices, right? And obviously, uh, once they bring back the spices, they want to sell those spices into the European market. So. Uh, with that being the very simple business model, uh, what you will end up having is before they leave for India, they'll obviously uh, go and calculate, okay, if this ship brings back 10 tons of curry and one ton of curry is $100, then okay, the ship's total maximum revenue uh, or sorry, profit achieve, uh, revenue achievable for their journey is going to be $1,000. And obviously, you might subtract the costs of paying the crew um, and all the different you know, tolls and wages and overhead that goes into sailing to India. And you might have a, end up having a profit, and that profit would be shared among all the holders of uh, a share of the ship. So if I were someone who was um, actually pricing a share, maybe I'll take that profit or dividend um, that I believe or project will be distributed to me, and then I'll go ahead and discount it back. Um, maybe I would say, hey, there's a huge risk, so maybe I want to buy this share for less. Obviously, it's a dynamic market as well. Say the ship has only taken off for a month, and right now it's in West Africa. And there was a courier that came back from West Africa and said, hey, there's been a big embargo and blockade on ships. And the ship that you invested in one month ago it is right now stuck in the port of Sierra Leone. If that were the case, your the risk tied to that specific share obviously went up and as risk goes up price might go down so if you're the owner of that share you might even though you bought that share for ten dollars per share you might quickly want to sell that for eight dollars or maybe even less depending on how you measure that risk so again everything that you're seeing in today's stock market it was something that was already done centuries ago using the same concepts the same methodologies my second question which Asian country, other than China, experienced an economic miracle starting from the end of World War II and into the 1990s? I'll give maybe 10 to 15 seconds for a response. All right, so uh, that is correct. We have three, three participants come in and say Japan, and yes, it is Japan, an economic miracle from the end of World War II all the way into the 1990s. Um, so again, uh, I see another question that uh, maybe someone who just came in is asking, hey, what is this seminar about? Uh, this seminar, again, is about PEVC cross-border investment, um, and again, uh, as I'm kind of explaining, 
what we're doing with Japan. I also want everyone to key in on how the very first inception of stocks in the Netherlands, that was already in many ways a form of cross-border or global investment, meaning, meaning where stocks at the first started, um, it was in a um, it was in a landscape or a, in a scenario where there was actually cross-border global enterprise. But why did I bring up Japan? Japan, Japan's rise uh, in many ways uh, was very much facilitated by the United States. Uh, obviously, their national constitution was also in many ways influenced or drafted by the United States. Uh, but after World War II, a lot of resources, investment, capital flows, went from the United States into Japan to help stimulate that economy. And what we saw, obviously, was Japan go from a country who was already pretty strong before World War II, uh, having suffered a lot of damage during World War II, rise out of that, out of the ashes of their defeat, and then uh, become actually, uh, prior to the last 20 years, the second largest GDP in the world. And something really interesting started to happen in the late 1990s. We started to see American enterprises, uh, because of the vastness and uh, the scale of the Japanese market, decide to start moving their businesses into Japan. So we had companies, uh, and again, because this is the uh, Fudan Tanhai International School of Finance, I'm gonna choose some finance uh, companies here. There's companies like Morningstar, E-Trade, and here's a name that maybe everyone, I'm not sure what the average age range here is, but you guys might be familiar, Yahoo. So Morningstar Japan, uh, Morningstar in the US after the financial crisis, it's lost a lot of its um, reputation, but in Japan, Morningstar is still one of the top rating agencies and highly relied upon within its capital markets. E-Trade, a very big online brokerage firm, uh, in the United States all throughout the 80s, 90s, and it was uh, understandably the largest online brokerage in all the United States. Uh, it actually incorporated into Japan under a joint venture with SBI. And that's uh, even today uh, when E-Trade in the US has uh, actually has not had very good performance and was ultimately purchased by Morgan Stanley uh, two years, two to three years ago. Um, E-Trade, E-Trade descendant in Japan, SBI Tenjin, it's actually still the number one online brokerage in Japan. You have Yahoo. Uh, obviously, uh, it's been taken private by a private equity firm, Apollo, uh, in, in the United States. But Yahoo Japan is still one of the largest technology companies in Japan surviving extremely well. So what does this really tell us? It tells us that uh, when you have developing economies uh, in many ways competing with each other around the world, uh, trends, they follow each other. As the US began to adopt more internet technologies and embed those internet technologies into their business, um, adopt more data analytics into their business, you have Morningstar, E-Trade, Yahoo, big businesses during their prime in the US uh, come and blossom. Um, a lot of the same trends in other economies that are coming right behind the US, uh, they'll also go ahead and grab those examples and then re, uh, refound or reestablish their businesses in a brand new geographic market. And what we saw in Japan was that even when the US side of these companies, uh, they didn't do as well, the Japan side it still thrived in very incredible ways. China is another great example. In the early 2000s now, Chinese entrepreneurs saw uh, Google as a great example and started to find you. Alibaba maybe got some of its inspiration from Amazon and e-commerce that was happening in the United States. And so what we're seeing is that if the US has 330 million people, and this is probably something that has been repeated over and over again, but you know, the US has 330 million people, advanced technology, great solutions, great products that could offer to its market. What if we were to take those same business models and concepts and bring them into China? And uh, another larger market, growing even faster and see how that specific business can expand in that market and create influence. So what I'm trying to allude to here and for everybody just um, very simply is that when it comes to cross-border PEBC investment, a lot of what we as investors do is uh, think about a time machine. We think about 
what are some very successful uh, cases of uh, technology, uh, of solutions, of products that have worked extremely well, have created their own uh, universe of ecosystems, and um, have really thrived? And does that product or solution uh, or innovation apply to a different market? So what we've been doing at Lone Partners uh, very much uh, for the last six years is to think about, hey, what are the actual uh, companies outside of China that are extremely innovative that we could bring to China? And what are the things that China does extremely well that we could bring maybe overseas and make those investments? So um, on the left-hand side here, you guys will see that um, this is maybe uh, a very quick or simplified summarized approach of how Golden Partners and myself, we think about investments. And we also invite everybody, whether you're investing in the public stock markets or you yourself are thinking about doing a little bit of private equity as well, to start framing investment decisions in this way, which is first to view or observe some type of trend, a prevailing trend, um, something that's immediately obvious and very mature in a specific market and see if that could be applied somewhere else. So uh, in the US, early 2000s, you have the boom of internet. You have a lot of companies like SAP, Oracle, Microsoft um, work with businesses to help them make more data-driven business decisions. And due to the rapid rise of online businesses in China itself, uh, we realized that, hey, China's business leaders, they're becoming increasingly reliant on data, data and they want to make more decisions based off of data, data as well. And so the key question for us that when we were investing is, hey, which geography has the most advanced data analytics solutions? Which data analysis platform is especially geared towards delivering business intelligence most efficiently? And so, hey, we would go ahead and make an investment in a company called ThoughtSpot based out of the Silicon Valley. Uh, which provides business is a business intelligence platform that in, that uh, can quickly ingest data and help summarize that data into uh, illustrations, graphics uh, for a manager to see. Um, same thing works the other way. We might go ahead and take a look at, um, hey, what does China possess? For example, Alipay, WeChat Pay, for those of us who are in China today, um, it is the most seamless, most efficient, uh, and very profitable, very, very profitable business uh, here in China. Um, which geographies outside of China, they're rapidly growing, but may lack this type of payment technology or a more advanced payment solution. And so uh, a lot of what we do in cross border PDC is, hey, we realize Japan, even though it's a very mature economy, only about 20% of its population use mobile payments. 80% still use cash. We invest in places like Brazil, where people uh, are very familiar with mobile payments, but the penetration of uh, with mobile, but the penetration of mobile payments has been extremely low. When you go to places like Africa, where hey, they actually do use mobile payments, however, they don't have as good of a technological infrastructure, and they don't have capabilities of going outside of Africa to do cross-border payments and remittances. So. Uh, again, this is just a little bit of a sharing for everybody to see, um, you know, a little bit of the investment thinking that we do. Again, identifying, observing the trends that are prevalent, asking key questions about, hey, where can this specific trend or development or mature technology uh, be capitalized? And then making an investment uh, into that new marketplace that would be highly receptive and be able to grow and enhance and uh, localize that technology and then expand their business from there. On the right hand side here, uh, I just want to quickly allude that um, a lot of PEVC firms nowadays as well, uh, besides just you know, sending the money and uh, making an investment, uh, everyone's also highly focused on providing financial advisory, uh, or some form of venture making with their portfolio companies. So something that we do at Lone Partners, um, just very briefly, is after we invest in a company like ThoughtSpot, we aim to create a joint venture with them and help bring their business to China or help them connect to a China partner here that's already doing data analytics and see how there's, there could be a win-win scenario. Um, something else here that I just really wanted to share with you guys is just this idea of 
uh, that is also very prevalent in cross-border PEVC, which is a portfolio ecosystem approach. Um, I myself, I am an American-born Chinese. Uh, I have a Western background, but uh, my DNA is very much Eastern. Um, because of my Western background, I might not know the very specific cultures and habits uh, within China. So if you were to tell me, even if you were to give me a lot of resources and capital to come to China to build a business, uh, just purely based off of those cultural, cultural discrepancies, I might not be able to uh, do very well with my business. So a lot of what people are trying to do today in the PEVC industry is actually form a portfolio ecosystem around their portfolio companies to invest both overseas and within China at the same time. See if there might be some synergistic collaborations that our portfolio companies overseas and within China can have with each other. And then obviously, uh, if the situation is correct, bring those overseas companies into China and launch joint ventures with them or start new projects uh, or brand new business opportunities with them. So uh, just very quickly, uh, you know, I know a lot of people here are thinking about are thinking about uh, going into uh, an MBA and perhaps after the MBA, you guys might want to work for investment banks. You guys might want to work for consulting firms. You guys might want to work for accounting firms. All the things that you would learn in investment banking and consulting in all these different excellent industries, these are things that could ultimate, are ultimately brought into the private equity and also venture capital pool to help increase the value of portfolio companies that are being invested in. Um, I want to go ahead and jump uh, through this slide. This is just to kind of give everyone a quick clue in terms of, hey, if you're a PEVC uh, that is doing cross-border investment, um, you know, what are some of the exciting new geographies, uh, old geographies or new geographies that uh, people are typically focused on? Now, I, given that, you know, we're coming up a little bit on time, I do want to jump over to my third, uh, my third and final question. Is how can you take a cross-border PEVC view on your own education and career development? Uh, so uh, knowing that this is indeed a recruitment um, and uh, an event where we could all kind of do a little bit of exchange and exploration, uh, you know, figure out if a MBA is right for you, uh, especially an MBA program here at um, FISF in, in Shanghai. Um, uh, obviously, I'm not looking for anyone to really provide a uh, direct response here. It's more of a rhetorical question. But I do want to share with everyone a few slides that I found myself to be quite interesting. It's well known. It's well known that uh, China is currently uh, number two in GDP, uh, only second to the US. And um, I think there's a little bit of text cut off here. I do apologize. But, you know, economists, uh, analysts, uh, around the world have already staked their claim and said that, hey, China's GDP is very likely to surpass the U.S. by 2033. So again, if you're someone who is listening in on the seminar, trying to decide, hey, if is coming to China to do my MBA a very good idea? Um, I think this chart is uh, something that's very obvious to everyone who pays attention to any type of news or political, economical uh, developments around the world. The second graph here is actually also very interesting, is um, the average uh, household wealth in China. Um, obviously, the graph is going to look uh, like it's pointing towards the upper right-hand corner, but just very simply, it's growing at an annual rate of 15.5%. Uh, uh, I, I think people probably saw the um, announcements uh, just this past week of China's GDP growth rates. Uh, or targeted growth rates, and it happens to be about 6%, 6 5.5% uh, uh, for this upcoming year. Um, again, this is just uh, something to show you guys that, you know, GDP, as GDP grows, household wealth grows even faster. So again, this is an extremely, extremely, um, you know, capital rich and growing uh, economy and market in the world. And, um, you know, if you're thinking about a career in finance, financial services, um, this is, again, an extremely ideal place to work. But here is what I actually want to get into, which is um, my real question here. If the GDP of China is now number two, and you also have the fastest, the fastest growing 
um, you know, uh, household wealth uh, in the world as well. It would only make sense that in this marketplace, there is probably a lot of financial institutions, namely asset management firms that are managing large amounts of money on behalf of their clients and helping to direct capital uh, to help grow this economy. So my question to everyone, and again, this is a report produced by Willis Tower Watson, uh, I think we had it Institute, of the top 50 asset management companies in the world, how many are from China? Um, and for this, I know we're coming up on time, but I'll go ahead and give it maybe 15 seconds for people to um, write their answers, submit their answers into the, uh, into the platform. Again, GDP is number two quickly growing, going to surpass the United States in 2033. You have um, household wealth uh, growing at 15.5% on average every single year. Under these circumstances, how of the 50 top asset management in the world, how many are from China? I see one response so far. Let's see if, uh, give it another 10 to 20 seconds. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and show everyone the answer. This is the list of the top 50. Some names are pretty uh, famous, BlackRock, you know, they're, and this is in millions, right? So this is pretty much 8.6 trillion USD, 8.7 trillion USD. So trillions or hundreds of billions of dollars. And if you guys have been looking at the screen and taking a look at this list, you'll realize that the correct answer is zero. The correct answer is zero. Based upon uh, the research provided by Wolf Tower Watson, uh, there are no asset management companies from China um, that are in the world's top 50. There's gonna be a lot of reasons why this is the case, but what I want everyone to do is to actually combine all the things that we just saw. Number two in GDP, fastest growing household wealth, but no asset management company in the top 50. The very first company uh, that is ranked within the top 100 is actually placed at 77th. It's Yifeng Management, Yifeng Da, um, which is based out in Hong Kong. And uh, you know they are actually last year they're probably in the 80s. This year they're in the 70s. Um, I expect that as the years go on and as we get closer to the time where China takes its place as the largest and most uh, you know the highest GDP, world number one rank in the world, um, I have no doubt that there will be more. And so the question to everyone on this call here is: If you want to work in finance. If you want to uh, eventually maybe become someone who works uh, with or alongside an asset management firm managing money uh, in a very exciting city, and if you want to receive the best possible education uh, to uh, you know, uh, be fully capable uh, to work in this market, uh, to have the background for this market and have an understanding of this market, and maybe uh, just maybe one day uh, you who, you know, sitting across uh, your computer, listening in on the seminar, uh, might be a part of or even lead um, a Chinese asset management company that will be on this list one day. So, uh, with that being said, uh, I want to thank everyone for um, your time uh, and attention during this um, brief uh, seminar about Prosper PEVC investment. Again, I know that some of you in the industry might have been waiting for me to go talk about how different varying Fed interest rates might affect uh, the cost of capital in different geographies that we're investing in, or you guys might want to hear about how political uh, or economic events might affect our own investments or what we might look at, LTV to CAC ratios. But today, I really want to take a step back and get back to the fundamentals of what is PVC and how do cross-border investors actually think about identifying good investments. Um, on the left-hand side, this is kind of our QR code for the Lun WeChat account. And on the right-hand side, 
this is just a simple newsletter of unicorn companies that we've invested in uh, that are doing quite well uh, at the moment and everyone can uh, learn a little bit more about their business models and their needs for funds. You know, I'll, I'll stop right there and I'll see if anyone has any questions. Uh, I believe we have 10 minutes a lot for Q&A uh, and I'm happy to uh, stick around. We only have five minutes for Q&A and I'm happy to stick around to uh, uh, see if anyone has uh, any questions that I can answer. I know I didn't get uh, very deep into my background, but I, I do want to also say that uh, Lun Partners, uh, my firm is actually a partner of Lun Fenhai and um, every single year, we do hire uh, several interns from them to join us in our company. Um, so, you know, if you're someone who is highly interested in what I just said about possible investment um, and doing global private equity while being located in China, um, you know, feel free to you know add add us and then get get into a conversation. Um, if you have any questions uh, with regards to uh, general uh industry investment industry in china as well uh, i could try my best to answer as well yeah i think uh, people are probably just preparing about two minutes and then if there's no answer we will be the next time Does Lin Partners hire potential employees for international students? Yes, we do. Uh, and the, sorry, guys, the question is Does Lin Partners hire interns or employees for international students? That is, uh, we actually right now uh, have one, um, one intern who is from France. and. Uh, is currently doing their full-time MBA at uh, Fudan Fentai. And um, he does school for half the day, and then uh, the other half he comes to the office and works alongside me uh, on investment projects. How's your strategy? Uh, another question just came in. How is your strategy to manage, manage risk in macroeconomic way? Okay, yeah, so um, obviously this is like a pretty broad question, so I don't want to get into too much of the specifics, but um, at investment firms, we develop what we like to call frameworks. Uh, frameworks about uh, frameworks on, uh, about thinking about different types of problems in geography. So when it comes to thinking about the macroeconomic uh, situation, for example, um, uh, something were to happen in the US, something were to happen in Ukraine. Um, a lot of what we do is we think about uh, first uh, the financial and the monetary side of what's happening. So that has to do with interest rates, forex rates. It has to do a lot with uh, supply chain and also import export rates. Um, the second thing that we also look at uh, is um, a lot of what we would just call uh, simple. <clears throat> simple trends, simple trends that would affect behavior and qualitative uh, framework around, hey, if there is a war in Ukraine right now, um, would and we have a portfolio company in Ukraine offering services, uh, how might this war affect the behavior uh, of a specific um, uh, consumer group? And would they still want to continue to purchase products or solutions from our portfolio company? Um, but overall, again, um, we try to sort frameworks by, by Country. We try to sort frameworks by um, economy, economic zones, and we also try to sort frameworks for uh, specific consumer groups whenever a macroeconomic situation occurs. How, uh, okay, and then we have another uh, question really quickly here is how essential is Chinese language ability to work in finance in China? That is a great question. So uh, I myself, I am bilingual and I do have, uh, you know, uh, pretty quick, I'm pretty conversational in Mandarin, and I'm capable of holding a professional conversation in Mandarin as well. However, I do have to say that a lot of what I learned uh, in terms of communication while, while I was in China uh, has been learned on the job. Uh, I had to know what uh, ghost profit margin translates to in Chinese. Uh, I had to learn that uh, uh, while I was getting ramped up and onboarded. I do want to say, uh, for Lun partners specifically, we do not have a hard restriction if uh, someone is 
uh, not proficient in Chinese language, the intern that I was just referring to is actually uh, taking Chinese classes over the weekend so that he could improve his Chinese and um, you know continue to get better. Um, if we're just asking uh, in general within this market, I do think that at the moment it is somewhat harder to uh, actually uh, you know uh, go into a um, a Chinese uh, firm uh, without any uh, Chinese language skills. Uh, however, what you should focus on is uh, even starting in 2018, 2019, there's a lot of announcements of foreign financial institutions coming to China, whether it be BlackRock, Tomasic from Singapore. Um, so here in Shanghai, where Fudan Tanhai also is, uh, the number of international firms um, in China has been growing and they do uh, obviously accept candidates who are not uh, native Chinese speakers. Okay, and the last question is career-wise, what are the differences between working for BC and PE? What is the career projection for each one? Um, okay, so uh, I, I do wanna quickly note uh, for, just to be clear for everyone, uh, venture capital is a type of private equity. Okay, venture capital is a type of private equity, uh, but we like to say VCP because they are, uh, usually when people refer to VC, it's investments to your early stage uh, startups who are ramping up. And then for PE, it's more about, hey, it um, doesn't matter how mature the company is, uh, we might invest and take them private, we might wanna take a majority stake and then restructure the company and change its management team. Um, so this is what I would say, uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, VC and PE, uh, the work content, uh, obviously you might be looking at different metrics because the types of companies you're analyzing are uh, clearly different. Uh, the pacing and what's required of you, for example, in VC, your career is going to be a little bit more networking based. You'll work more hands-on with founders and actually go through a long-term journey. Uh, in PE, uh, a lot of what you're doing because companies that you're investing in are already uh, at a much higher scale at much larger scale and more mature scale. So there's a lot more quantitative work involved with that. And there's also a lot of deal making and complications with structuring uh, different deals uh, alongside different financial institutions. So I would say that um, PE more traditionally, it's, it's a more quantitative advanced uh, career. Uh, so you have to be pretty good with numbers. Um, BC, uh, a lot of it is relationship building. Uh, but at the same time, you get to stand on the cutting edge, see what kind of new technologies are being developed, and then we work very hands-on, very close with founders. Um, and then uh, again, I, I think a lot of people, uh, just this very last one, was a career projection for each one. Um, it's very hard to answer a question like this because I know that uh, there are plenty of people who go into VC and then end up going uh, to join a portfolio company or being operators themselves, start their own funds. PE, uh, people who work in PE, they also uh, oftentimes end up uh, retiring early or perhaps even going and starting their own funds as well. But um, for the most part, a lot of people spend a lot of time in PEVC with the hope of becoming a investment or fund manager uh, by the time they are done with their career. All right, uh, with that, I wanna thank everybody again uh, for your time and attention. And I hope that this brief seminar was somewhat helpful, if not just a little bit familiar and fun for everyone to listen in on. Thank you again. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for your participation. And uh, then we will move to the next part. This will be the online for session. And we will have around like five to 10 minutes uh, brief introduction about the FMBA, which is finance business administration in finance. And then about 20 minutes on that. For all the English version, if you are international students, uh, after the English version, and feel free to leave the uh, meeting room. And if you are Chinese, then you can leave for another 30 minutes and I'll explain in Chinese again for you. Okay. So first of all, I want to introduce about our uh, program is about the location. We located in central Shanghai. It's because uh, our program is a very practical program, and uh, the location means students can do both the internship and practical and uh, do the series at the same time. And also, Shanghai is one of the economic centers in China. And uh, just imagine how many 
how many companies in, uh, in Shanghai and their main business is finance related. This is the pictures of our campus. There are total four campus, the Fudan University in Shanghai and the Academy campus, which is located in People's Square and in the very center of, uh, of Shanghai. And then it will be the uh, faculty. We have the faculty, all of the faculties, especially the full-time faculties, they put the PhD from the overseas. And there about the curriculum, we have the rigorous curriculum and uh, your study journey with uh, Fudan University start, start, start much earlier than expected. To be honest, we just, uh, in each May, we will start with some quick course for our uh, students, no matter you study finance before or not, you have to attend the free course. Uh, course most of the students have worked in, uh, uh, in the industry over two years or three years, and it's hard for them to go back to campus from as a student. That's why we will have a free course. And we will have class meetings before the curriculum as well. And also we have a lot of activities and uh, the FMD program will start in September each year. And in the first year, there will be the core modules. Uh, there's four modules with uh, totally 16 core courses. And we have the unique career mentor program, which means you can pick the uh, supervisors from the financial industry as your personal mentor. We also have external learning office if you want to learn some management related program, and you can pick up from the external learning office. We also have a very unique life course and care course for the international students and domestic students. And also we have life learning project. Maybe you will be curious about what is the difference between the life learning project and life care course. Life learning project is learning through the integrated precarious experience, which means, uh, for example, in module one, if you are interested in financial accounting, and then you can pick up the life learning project through the financial accounting. Well, if you are interested in the microeconomics, you can choose the microeconomics life learning project. And each of the project is the cases that exactly happen in the financial industry. While the life course is focused on the personal development, and also in year two, you will pick up the electives and then to do the thesis. You also will do some overseas modules here. About the external learning, this is the life learning project I'm talking about. Because you are the MBA student, you have to gain some management skills. And here are some uh, logos of the company that we have the corporate roots. This is only a very, very small bit of the companies we have the corporations. Actually, we, we have so many companies that uh, have already built corporations. And there is a light program. Because you are as an MBA student, we want to, you to have the soft skills for some leadership, innovation, team spirit, and ethics. And we will do all these uh, trainings in the light program. I saw some students online ask how much is the internship? Internship is like one of the credit course and uh, in the curriculum, especially in year one, you will see it's like in the, uh, at, at the end of the year one, students have to do the internships. Also, uh, most of our students will start to do the internship from the first module. And we will have the unit PDC department, which I will introduce later. And the, the staff from the PDC department, they will uh, tell your career development way for each of the students. And there will be the, this is the career support. And uh, this is one-to-one -one career consulting and uh, we will have the career plan seminar for each of the students. As the Wilson just introduced one of the international students uh, who is from France, and he uh, in module one, uh, in the study of module one, he has already found his uh, internship in one of the uh, asset management company. And then it will be the care in China for most of the international students. Uh, we will have the care course. It's not only to help you to explore the Chinese cultures, it's also to help you to be involved in the Chinese teams. And also uh, all of the Chinese students, they have to and they must attend the Chinese lessons during the two year study. And that will be the growth opportunity. We have the overseas modules and each student will have two courses, uh, two overseas modules uh, in the year two. 
And if you think the two or three weeks is too short for you, and you also get the chance to get the uh, second degree from our partner university, which is a uh, Wisconsin University and the University of Columbia. And this is some photos of our student life. As you will see, that, that we will have a wide range of activities for all of our students. If you see the on the very top right, this is the affinity with our professors. Uh, for our professors, you can meet them not on uh, during the official time, and we also will arrange and schedule uh, the afternoon tea time for, for every student. And you can book your time with the professors you like. You can talk with them about academic career uh, development, or you can talk about about the talk, talk with them about your personal development. And we also will have a lot of personal develop, uh, personal development activities for you. And this is a brief introduction. If you are interested in the FMB program, feel free to scan the QR code to join us. And uh, also feel free to drop the email. And if you uh, join the webinar through the China Admissions, you can also talk with one of the counselor in the China Admissions to know more details about the Buda University. And I think the English words and the English info session sharing will end up, uh, end up here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will spend like one minute to see if I can answer the questions. So someone asked how many years of working skills required to apply for the program. And we think we, uh, at least like two years working experience. But if you graduate two years ago, and in these two years, you join the postgraduate program or you didn't work at all, that's fine. You need to explain why you have the gap. Please tell me this uh, in this COVID 19 pandemic situation, when Chinese were open the board for the international students, to, um, I cannot answer these questions either. We hope we can open the board very soon. Do I need a GMAT or GRE to apply? Uh, is it nice? No. GRE or GMAT is not necessary, but it will help you to gain a scholarship. If you have the high score of GMAT or GRE, that, help, that will help a lot. And uh, the average GI or the, uh, we received is around th uh, 320. And the average GMAT we received is over 720, uh, 720, 720. I think that's all we run, off, run, run out of time at the China Admission. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email. Thank you, Rio and Wilson from Fanhai International School of Finance at Fudan University. So guys, if you have any questions for uh, Rio, especially for the FMBA programs, you can uh, ask Chan admissions later, or you can also contact them uh, via email for further information.